starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Jeff Farbman from the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Thank you uh, for joining us for this last session of uh, this special training series, uh, a collaboration between the National Good Food Network uh, and Farm Credit. Um, as you know, this is an office hours session where Aaron Pirro from Farm Credit East and Gary Madison from Farm Credit Council are here to answer your questions. There's no formal presentation today. Um, as the last office hours, you can ask any question you'd like, digging, into deeper, digging deeper into any of the topics we've covered in this uh, webinar series. So since this is intended to be an interactive session, let me just quickly go through the ways that you can interact with us. So uh, as, as usual, your screen looks something like this. Uh, the presentation left uh, on the control panel on the right. Uh, it might be way on the right-hand side. Uh, click the uh, that's little orange arrow here to expand it. And then you can keep it expanded uh, if you deselect auto-hide control panel in the view menu. Oh, uh, let me... All right, uh, so there are really two ways to interact with us, and both are through the control panel. One is, if you want, in the questions box, you can just type in your question, and uh, we will uh, we will address uh, written questions. But uh, it's it's kind of fun to be able to talk to us. Uh, so you can raise your hand and let us know that you'd like to talk to us. So uh, over hanging on the right hand side of uh, sorry that's the left hand side uh, of the control panel. There's a little hand icon that's raise your hand. If you click that button, we'll know that uh, you would like to talk to us, uh, and um, we can unmute you. If you're if you're called in, so in order to unmute you, you either have to be connected to audio through your computer and have a microphone or headset. Uh, so like a laptop will have a microphone built in, so that'll work. Um, if you're called in, in order to unmute you, you need to dial in your PIN. So on the, this last item here is the audio PIN. So you, you call the number, you do the access code, and then you do number sign, and then your PIN, and then number sign. And uh, then we will be able to unmute you. All right, so that's uh, that's it. Let's uh, let's get on to questions, either uh, written um, or um, or spoken with your raised hands. We're ready. <laughs> one one thing uh, that I I did want to point out is that uh, our our I will, I will stop. All right, excellent. First written question. Uh, thank you, Kendra. All right, there's a question about bad debt. How often should bad debt be recorded? Quarterly, biannual, yearly? I think that really depends on when you know that it's bad debt. So at the time, that's really a good time to address it and um, record it so that you know we don't have to deal with this later on, and everybody kind of can move on from there. Hopefully it's not very much, and hopefully it's not very often, so it's more of a, a housekeeping entry. Um, you know, but if it's coming up to be a bigger number, then that suggests perhaps there's other things that you want to take a closer look at. For instance, your accounts receivable policy, how long you are allowing folks to use your credit, so to speak, um, who you extend credit to, and so forth. But I'm... Um, expecting and certainly hoping there isn't too much around there. So it's just something you can address with your month end closing procedures and, and move on from there. Good, thanks. <clears throat> um, the, the coming up um, at the beginning of next year, um, we uh, are um, in, we will be running our next uh, Food Hub benchmarking study. Um, this is we've run we've done two uh, already uh, really uh, quite some interesting results um, and we're hoping that our our next one will include uh, even more hubs so uh, as people who are now educated on exactly how to keep your books um, we're hoping that you will be willing to participate so um, 
Aaron, if I can ask you just to sort of explain what uh, participation entails, what, what's, what's it cost me as a hub, and uh, what do I, what's in it for me as a hub? Sure. Well, the cost, thanks to all the work that Jeff has done, is just time. They've come up with uh, some funding for this project, which is fantastic. And while I realize time is dear, it's also some of the most important investments you can make. So now that you've been through this webinar series, you know what three financial reports we're going to be looking for. If you can supply those in Excel, that makes our job a whole lot easier. Otherwise, you can just send them as a PDF. Um, we will have a website portal for you to upload them confidentially at farmcrediteast.com. There will also be a questionnaire with about 30 operational questions, which if you're on top of your stuff, and now you are, you'll probably be able to gather that in no more than two hours. Uh, and if some of the stuff is new to you and you need a hand, we'll be able to provide a little bit of that as well. But it's going to be questions like, how many square feet of production or warehouse space do you have? or how many labor hours did your team work? And if you're keeping payroll records, that's an easy one to get out of a payroll report. Uh, if you've got volunteers, it makes sense to have them keep track of their hours, not only so you know what they did and you know how you're staffing, but also so the time comes they decide, you know what, we need to get paid for this, and you incorporate that into your business model, you have a great tool for budgeting. So those are the kind of operational questions we ask. Uh, then once we get all that information, we crunch the numbers so that we can see what's common in the industry. And that gives a broad perspective, which you'll all get as part of a report like Counting Values, if you've seen that one. Uh, but you'll also, for participating, get your personalized report, which, depending on the amount of data and the amount of hubs that participate, we'll be able to break down into several different categories. Uh, we're interested in looking at different size businesses, different business models, different locations, just to see what uh, the broad range of perspectives is for different kinds of food hubs. And you'll get that in a report that compares you, your food hub, against the benchmark so that you have part one and part two of the three benchmarking steps complete. And those are first analysis, which we're going to take care of a lot of. You can do that with your own food hub in different ways, certainly later on. Uh, the comparison part, we'll have it laid out for you side by side in the report. And then three, improvement, because if you never use this other than to look at the report, it's not a really useful tool, just like a hammer doesn't build a house all by itself. So if you take this, you can work on different brainstorming methods with your staff, your team, and figure out where do you want to go from here. The benchmarks suggest an opportunity in this area. How do we want to tackle that? So from there, you guys can take it and run. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Um, and Gary, if I if I can, I'm going to pull up the um, the counting values, the last benchmarking study, um, and uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, and uh, if you want to talk about um, a couple of these pages here, so here's I zoomed in ironically to size matters. Let's <laughs> <laughs> <I always> talk. Let's <laughs> talk. Um, one of the things that, that we did in the benchmark was uh, we had enough participants, uh, I think there were 49 in the end, that we could uh, divide those by size and try to take a look to see if uh, gross sales were an indicator of whether or not a food hub was going to be profitable. And as you can see in the, in the chart that's on your screen, um, the answer was, yeah, yeah on average, if you're bigger, you have have bigger gross sales. You have a better chance of uh, being profitable. It doesn't mean that there weren't smaller food hubs in that $125,000 or less category that were not profitable, but they had some special circumstance, some unique aspect of what they were doing, for instance, acting really more like a CSA, mm -hmm. um, that allowed them to be profitable at a small level. And the goal in, in showing you this and talking about this is not to say, well, you got to be big or get out. The, the goal here is I'm expecting that, that many of you who have been participating in the webinar series are planning a food hub. And the idea here is to communicate. You have to be able to plan to get over the rough spot that you know you're going to have as you grow sales. It's okay to do that as long as you have 
um, in your mind a way to plan how to grow sales um, so that you can project getting to a sales level that for for your cost structure is going to be profitable. So and again, back to the, the def my definition of profit is the ability to keep doing what you want to do again next year. Um, I'm not talking, I'm trying to make a distinction here between a nonprofit organization and a for-profit. The operational differences should be zero. Um, you should be operating that business to be able to achieve profit. The nonprofit gets to, um, as, a, as a matter of organization, gets to take that profit, whatever's left over, and spend it specifically on accomplishing missions. And that's about the difference between for-profit and nonprofit. It's what you do with the profits. Um, please don't think that if you're organized as a nonprofit, your goal is not to make money. Um, that means you can't keep doing what you want to do again next year. Um, we're all about we're all about suggesting that if you're a nonprofit, you have to maybe manage a little harder to be profitable, so that you can actually continue to serve that mission. Um, in a broader sense, you can think about even expanding your mission, and it's your mission is actually funded by your operation. So you're you're doing good in the world, and you're also uh, accumulating the capacity to do more good at the same time by being profitable. So just back to this idea of, of size, um, if you are planning a food hub, um, where you start is, is not as important as your plan to accomplish an increase in sales so that you can get to that point where you know you're going to be um, making money and hopefully the benchmark study the existing existing benchmark information that we're looking at some of now can help you um, see uh, what those uh, what those costs are uh, looking in the chart here the um, as as the food hub gets larger the cost of goods um, increases um, and then starts to level off at the at the higher levels um, knowing that, is, is uh, and expecting that is something that you need to plan for as your sales grow. Um, it's not that that necessarily is going to happen to you, but that's what that's what happens in general. So expect that. <clears throat> Aaron, you have anything? To add? I think, yeah, Gary, your point about planning is really important. So when you're starting out, you know, think about up here at the thirty thousand foot view of what are we going to accomplish, and that's where the big picture of your vision and mission starts with and then the goals um, or the objectives and then the goals for the food hub. So if one of the goals is to be financially sustainable, think about what it is that you need to accomplish. So in I think it was last year's benchmark webinar, Jeff, we went through budgeting from the bottom up. And that's something that Gary and I will include in our session at the food hub conference as well because it's such an important tool to know where do I need to get to and how much do I need to accomplish to do that. So if I know that I need to make $30,000 in profit after taxes in order to pay loans and save for reinvestment, that's my starting point. And then I know how much overhead I have because I know how much my monthly rent is or I know how much the interest is on my, pay on my uh, loan payment, mortgage or truck or whatnot. I know how much my utility bill is. I know how much uh, my insurance is, my repairs, those kinds of things from previous history. Now I know how much gross margin I need. And we did the margin study yesterday. We went through the effective margin. And I think a lot of times, especially when there is a nonprofit motivation in terms of the tax structure, we tend to price things on the very low margin side. And our results are from the last study is that this is a very low margin business to begin with. So if you approach it with that in mind, know that two, three, four, five pennies on every sales dollar can make a huge difference, not only to your bottom line, but to your ability to further your mission. And keep that in mind when you're pricing things and when you're buying things, because that can make a huge difference later on. If we can widen that margin a little bit, you'll be able to be here longer and be able to do more with what you're trying to accomplish. And that gets to Gary's point about why the cost of goods as the business grows become a larger portion of the business. Well, simply put, if I have $100,000 of overhead that I need to cover every year, 
when I'm only selling $125,000 worth of product or service, that's a big chunk of it. But when I get to be a million dollars, now it's only 10%. So that overhead is spread over many more units of product that I'm selling. So as a result, my business is just bigger and the cost of goods are going to take up more. Um, but I think also in the race to grow, I see a lot of people cut prices or cut margin in order to get more volume. And again, that study that we went through yesterday, just that quick example, I think really speaks volume as to what are you doing when you went to a 10% margin from a 12% margin or a 16% margin, you had to do a whole lot more in sales. And that can be tough to do. So just factor in all those things as you're doing planning and you're going to be light years ahead of someone that just set off to do what they wanted to do when they got out of bed in the morning. Yeah, two two things I wanted to quickly respond to. One was uh, uh, that um, a ben an industry benchmarking study is something that many industries do, and uh, in the 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 uh, culture in many industries is that you get access to the benchmarking study if you pay your dues to the industry. Um, so, sort of uh, trade association. Yeah, trade association. That is exactly. Mm -hmm. The phrase I was looking for. Um, so, uh, in, in the the way Aaron framed it is in in a sense, uh, Wallace Center has uh, comped everyone their trade association fees uh, to uh, get access to the benchmarking study, and all we ask is that uh, you participate, as Aaron said, at the time. So, uh, uh, the other thing that I wanted to respond to is <clears throat> uh, that. Um, a, a, a wise, steady, it seems to me that a wise, steady state uh, business operations for nonprofits and uh, nonprofit hubs is to uh, not look to uh, uh, government or philanthropic dollars to run your operations, but to do your nonprofit y stuff um, and perhaps not even uh, require that your operations. Fund your nonprofity stuff. Um, so it, almost think of it as yes, you run you uh, run a food hub uh, because that's a required uh, piece of infrastructure and activities that have to happen in your area in order to see your mission through. Um, but again, in steady state, uh, the early early stage is different. Um, but um, but uh, that you know your 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 that piece of infrastructure uh, and services has to be around for the long term. Otherwise, uh, your farmers, your buyers, n no one can feel super confident that you're going to be around all the time. Um, and then uh, your your mission based stuff that doesn't have to do with uh, which. Uh, farmers you choose to work with that's that's part of operations and it's sort of where mission operations overlap but uh, say food safety education for farmers or these sorts of uh, educational or um, uh, other uh, typical uh, hub activities that uh, or even uh, like an umbrella uh, uh, insurance policy. Those might do better uh, as um, philanthropic. That, that, that would do better really as operations uh, if you can do it, but um, but it's it's kind of, it's somewhat optional. Anyway, uh, that's that's my, those two little reactions. We do have a couple more. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, one thing, just as you were talking about, um, you know, you guys sort of comping everybody for industry dues. One of the important things that we heard about the last Food Hub study and looking forward to the benchmark again is that because it's a newer business model, I realize it's not brand new. Some of the hubs have been around for a long, long time. But as an emerging business model, an emerging sector, it's still important for a lot of the service providers and partners to understand exactly how Food Hubs work from a financial perspective. And when those providers are in a place where they better understand that, they're a whole lot more willing and likely and able to participate with whatever a food hub needs, whether it's lending, um, whether it's um, some kind of technical service, you name it. So by participating, that really helps you benefit the industry, something that you can then take part in later. And I know there's a reaction of, well, why should it be me sometimes? But I think about last week, um, I had applied through Farm Credit to take a really intense leadership training course. 
And they just came back last week and said, no, for the amount that we'd be spending on it, we think we want to see how we can leverage that better and have, you know, another half dozen of your colleagues participate as well. So now I'm faced with the question of, do I put in the effort to organize the program for everybody or not? Well, I don't get to participate if I don't organize that. So is it worth my extra effort? Darn right it is. So that's one of my next projects when I get back. Nice. Good. Um, uh, th so there are a couple questions, but I, I wanted to um, uh, also point out uh, the in the last section of the last benchmarking study, uh, there's uh, uh, a section all about how to use the benchmark study as a tool, and uh, there's a whole uh, we step through a whole example here, um, and uh, it's. Uh, it's sort of the uh, next level of applying uh, the knowledge that you've gained in these webinars to uh, here as a hypothetical situation, but then you can uh, go ahead and apply it to, to your situation. So I thought I'd put that plug in too. Um, uh, okay, uh, so there's actually a follow-up question on, uh, on bad debt. The question is, do you have standard practices for collections and bad debt? Is is there even a, a like a written standard operating procedures document to share? Ooh, well, that'd be a good one to put on the listserv, I think. Um, you know, so for farm credit, for instance, obviously we're working with loans. When I was a loan officer, it was, you know, the payment is due on the first. If it doesn't show up in the next week, that's a phone call or an email. If it doesn't show up within 10 days, that's another one. You know, and then 15 days, it's okay, um, go see the person or some other form of one-on-one -on -one communication. Um, if it goes further than that, then there are different steps of, well, now your interest rate is at risk of being raised, your revolving privileges are at a risk of being cut off, those kinds of things. And I think every organization should have exactly what you described. Um, so one is setting the expectation of when you should get paid. Uh, do you require a deposit up front? Should you? Uh, credit cards on file we talked about. Um, certainly that adds a level of complexity and, and information management, but if you require that someone's credit card be on file with you, that's a really good way to ensure that if you're not paid within 10 days, you could charge it. So a couple of those to put together, but is that something you could put out in the listserv, Jeff? Tim, I'm currently checking to see if there is something already on the server because okay. I, I started to th I, I remembered that there was a conversation on uh, accounts receivable. So I'm, I'm searching now. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I will post what I find. Um, <laughs> no problem. Well, what did Gary do as a business owner? I know for our chefs, we say if you don't pay within three weeks, then your price goes up 10%. That's usually a pretty good motivator. Yeah, it, I, I think um, it's important to have um, that, that list of, of a time-based list that, that Aaron went through. And, you know, you can rewind the tape of this webinar and get that list of what happens after so many days. It's, it's very well documented um, what's going to happen after so many days, the phone call followed by the visit, that kind of stuff. But I, I think it's important also to identify Who's going to do that? Um, you know, who is is it the is it the person who's doing the selling that is going to follow up and collect that, or is, are you going to? Is there somebody else that mm -hmm. can do that? Because you have to consider what what's going to happen to your selling relationship. Um, you know, this isn't too much inside baseball, I guess, but you know, the good cop bad cop thing is okay. Uh, you want the the person who is your sales face. The person who's doing the, the sales calls to to have the good news. It's okay to have somebody else responsible for the bad news. Like you know, we're going to have to shut you off uh, shipping if you don't pay this. Um, you know, when you want to have the <clears throat> the salesperson actually communicate that is probably farther down the road. I would say having somebody else, an office manager type person, um, <clears throat> communicate the or do those collection calls, uh, it would be my preferred way of doing it first. I think it's all about the relationship, too. You know, if you look at your bad debts, are they people that you knew well and had a good relationship with, or are they people that you worked with once and, you know, 
then what happens? I find that most people that you work with aren't trying not to pay you. Um, if you know them well, then they probably hit a really rough patch. But if you encourage even small payments over time, like 50 bucks a week until we get this paid off, that can go a long way. And then at least you get something as opposed to paid all now or else. Any luck, Jeff? Yes. Here, I can, I can, let me show my screen here. Okay, um, there is a, a I, hope you, I hope you all are members of the Food Hub Community of Practice. If you aren't, uh, just let me know. You can email me uh, at uh, contact at ngfn.org is probably the easiest. But <clears throat> uh, So Stuart, uh, who works at uh, Cherry Capital Foods uh, in Traverse City, Michigan, uh, posted something. Uh, and uh, there are really several uh, great posts. Uh, this one um, goes through, will I be paid and when will I be paid? All these bullets. Um, there's um, Jason suggests getting a system together and uh, here's uh, a 12-step <laughs> program. Um, uh, Lauren Handel, who is uh, a, a lawyer, part of the food law firm, um, uh, uh, posted the um, uh, PACA, uh, which is the produce something. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah, ag there, there you go. Uh, uh, and there for uh, produce sellers with, uh, it has to be uh, interstate produce sales, not intrastate. So that's kind of s snags a lot of hubs who are very local. But uh, you are, uh, if you are moving uh, a, a ton of produce a day, um, then you're required to uh, pay these packet dues and then you are protected. Um, so if someone refuses to pay, uh, you, you uh, according to PACA rules, and there's um, the it has the full force of the government, and uh, you will be paid sort of as a debtor f first on the top of the list. Um, so uh, there's there's stuff there. So go go to your uh, your colleagues um, and uh, go go to the website, uh, search on the Food Hub Community of Practice, and if you don't find what you want, please post your question. That's a that's a great point. Thank you, Aaron, for that service plug. Uh, hey, there's a lot of good stuff there. Why reinvent the wheel? Yeah, well, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there's got to be some reason. It's so satisfying to, re to invent the wheel that, you know. <laughs> Great job security, so I have more projects. I get it, but <laughs> we want to work on new and different things, oh, not just the same thing all the time. <laughs> Uh, Jamie is very enthusiastic, asks, uh, is the budgeting from the bottom up available online? Not yet. Yes. <laughs> oh, it is? It was, yeah, it's one of the, we did it in one of the webinars. Um, I think it was for presenting the Food Hub Benchmark study. Ah, uh, 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 uh. okay, okay. I'm going to need to take it back. I'll have to look on my screen which one it was, but yes, yeah, it's in one of those too. Okay. Good. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. Gary can give the next answer. Have you got another question? Well, I'm, I'm muted. Both of the benchmarking webinars are linked to uh, from that uh, from that archive webpage, ngfn.org slash uh, hub finance hub finances. Um, so, and I can uh, show you that um, as I uh, ask the next question. Uh, question is, can you explain carryover of losses and whether they should show on a balance sheet? I'm still confused on where a complete loss from, uh, from a fire several years ago should be documented on, on an ongoing balance sheet. It shows up on tax form MX and scares potential lenders. Go for it, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, one's, that one's beyond me, Aaron. <laughs> okay, so fire loss several years ago. So you had an amount to write off, but because it's a casualty loss, you don't get to write it off. 
all in one year, you have this really sounds like a deferred tax asset carrying forward. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay, so usually that is on the balance sheet, um, but it's really something in your favor in terms of, obviously the asset is gone um, because it was destroyed in the catastrophe. So now um, you've rebuilt, you have, assuming you've rebuilt, you have new things, new assets on the balance sheet. You may or may not have liabilities against those. That's all on the balance sheet. Um, but what was the, you said you're carrying it somewhere, MX is what you? It shows up on a tax form uh, and scares potential okay. letters, lenders. Because it's really, I mean, at that point, it's a tax thing. If it was my barn that burned, my barn is now gone. If I had a loan against it still, hopefully I had insurance to pay down that loan. So I start from square one or maybe have a little bit left over to start again. So when I build the new barn, I have that on my balance sheet and then I have whatever assets I um, either put cash into it or I needed to borrow to build that barn. So there's really nothing left over from an operational perspective. It's just this tax thing carrying forward because I do get that casualty loss credit. And however much it was compared to is it your income, I'd have to check on that point how quickly you can write that off. Um, so that's a good conversation from your accountant. It's really a tax thing more than it is a you know, it wouldn't show up in the market value of your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what she's saying. It's not on the it's not on the balance sheet. Yeah. Okay. What are they scared of? Do they just not understand it or is it a further I question of Can I can I unmute you? Let me unmute you. I'm gonna try it. Let's let's try it. <laughs> was that permission or was that uh <laughs> Kendra, can you can you <laughs> Do you want to talk? Nope. Well, you're unmuted. Yeah, looks like it's not working. Nope. Are you there, Kendra? All right. Well, good so try. We'll, yeah, that's right. Okay. Put her back on mute. It sounded like she was, she was working. Um, let me show you. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this is uh, what you're looking at now is ngfn.org slash hub finances. It, it, resolves to resources slash food blah, 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 blah. but did you just tell all I have to remember is sub finances or in the food hub section it's the last one here finances so uh, on here um, is uh, all of all of these recordings links to all of these recordings um, and then at the bottom some reports and resources and so uh, here are the 13 and 14 uh, food hub benchmarking studies uh, as well as a CSA benchmarking uh, webinar uh, and then uh, I have the common chart of accounts down here as well. Um, so uh, good, uh, good place, good resource place. Uh, go, go view um, these benchmarking webinars. I, I think it was the more recent one, the 2014 one. Sweet. I think that's what I think. I could be wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, so. Uh, Okay, um, so uh, the response is uh, it uh, it scares lenders uh, because they do not see profit that is larger than the loss, or that's that's her sense of what she's hearing. So the hmm. I, think, I mean I think a lot of that is probably making sure that you have a lender that's not a you know a box checker so to speak because there are a lot of credit scoring programs where you have to put this number from this line in here and then the computer spits out an approval or not. But I know from my training, we had intensive tax uh, work that we had to do to understand all the different complexities of what a business tax return might present to us. 
Uh, and that makes a huge difference because this loss is over and done with, right? I mean, it's not something that recurs. It happened once a bunch of years ago. You just have the ability to carry this forward as a, a write-off against income each year. So that's affecting how much you pay in taxes now. It's not anything really to do with operations, correct? Yeah. I mean, Sorry, this is one of those, can you ask uh, him to please uh, pass the salt conversation? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's working with your lenders to make sure that they understand how your business operates and what this is and that may be something where you want to have a meeting with your accountant, your lender and you together so that everybody is on the same page. And you know, some days I have a job simply because you don't clean your room when your mom tells you you're messy, you clean your room when your friends tell you you're a slob. <laughs> that might be a really good indication of this situation. I don't know if that helps, but it can be worth a try. Uh, she says, thank you. It helps helps her better to have the conversation. So that's that's great. That's great. Good. All right. Uh, any other questions? Any other points, Gary, Aaron, you'd like to cover? Thanks for joining us, guys. I mean, I know uh, finance is a whole other language, and not everybody likes it, and not everybody understands it or wants to, but it's so important. And I'm just so excited that you all joined us and took part in this, and really look forward to working with you on the next version of the Food Hub Benchmark. And, and I think it's, it's worth uh, uh, mentioning why Farm Credit is doing this, what, why, why we're interested in this, and um, I think it comes from, from several angles. Erin, um, in, in, in her job as a business consultant, is, is there as a member of the Farm Credit Cooperative to help the members succeed. Um, they have to pay for it. I mean, you know, she's a, uh, an employee that, that uh, works on contract with uh, members of farm credit and people who aren't members or borrowers of farm credit. So there's there's that aspect of it, but I don't want you to get so focused on on that that you miss the point that what farm credit is trying to do is is increase market access for farmers. Um, the the ability to aggregate food and get more locally grown food into um, the wider um, wholesale markets for, for food is a really important thing that food hubs are doing that's, that's going to benefit not just small farmers, but um, predominantly small farmers or, or mid-scale farmers wherever there's a food hub. So um, we want to help you succeed as food hubs because we want to help farmers succeed in being able to have the kind of business that they want at the scale they want and be able to find markets more easily because um, that's the hardest thing in farming is selling the darn stuff. Uh, growing it is, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say it's easy, but selling it is harder. And to have a good partner like a food hub is, uh, for, a, for a portion anyway, of what a farmer is growing is, is a, a great strategy and a, and a great help. So we're trying to help you succeed so that eventually we have more farmers succeeding in however they want to do business. That's awesome. Great partners, guys. <laughs> and thank you, guys, really. Uh, it, it, this, this has been a, a, a great series, and I know it's taken a lot of your time. Uh, and uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's one of these that is now added to the canon. Um, and uh, and we'll continue to, uh, uh, the good food movement will continue to reap rewards by watching these as, as uh, new hubs come up and are being planned. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, I look forward to all of your feedback on the final post-webinar survey. Um, so, uh, 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 webinars, remember all of these webinars are recorded um, and they're posted on uh, ngfn.org slash uh, hub, hub finances. Let me show you that page again. Oh, I may have closed it. Anyway, uh, 
uh, or or ngfn.org slash webinars uh, is the other way and uh, just find find this webinar series and they're all there um, in their wonderful glory um, and uh, feel free to share those with anyone. You don't have to have uh, taken part in the first time around to uh, to watch those archives. That we we want to provide that uh, to any and all. All right. Again, thank you all. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.